I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with pediatricians Judith Palfrey of Harvard Medical School and Children's Hospital Boston, and Sean Palfrey of Boston University School of Medicine and Boston Medical Center. The Palfreys have written a perspective article on preventing gun deaths in children. To start with the tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut, and from your perspective as pediatricians, what are the surviving children of Sandy Hook Elementary School going through now, and what can their parents and their physicians expect in terms of the care they're going to need in the time ahead? First of all, we all absolutely mourn the loss of the children who passed during the uh, tragedy. And, but when we think about the children who were there, who experienced this in a normal day in their life, to have a disaster like this occur, it really puts it into the context of what we know about disasters and what we know about how disasters affect children. And we have enough experience from earthquakes and tsunamis and things around the world to know that there are really three periods. There's an early uh, effect, a mid-effect, and then long-term. And during the early effect, the children are extremely frightened. They don't know whether something's going to happen again. They need the comfort and the counsel of their families and their community. And that's why it's been so beautiful to see how many people have come into this area bringing comfort and being, bringing uh, the resources of community. And that's what they need more than anything. But as the time comes back, uh, over the next few months, uh, they're going to continue to have some effects. And they tend to be the kinds of effects of uh, losing uh, maybe control of, of uh, some of their body functions. They may, in fact, end up wetting the bed or having difficulty with their eating. Uh, they, they may act like a younger child, child who maybe uh, had been uh, sucking their thumb and had given that up may, may start again. Um, so it's very important for their families to recognize this. This is normal. This is, this is what absolutely normally happens to children. Uh, and not to f panic that they're going to remain in that kind of a, a, a situation. Um, and that may go on for some months. The next thing that may happen is that, and particularly in this case, they may not want to go to school. They may not want to pick up on those kind of activities or, or leave their families. And so one of the things that we've learned is very gently that reestablishing routines, school, the requirements of daily life is crucial for them. And then, of course, there is the long-term concern with an effect like this of such a, a brutal experience that they've had, uh, that this is going to be part of them, be part of their being. Uh, whether they will have post-traumatic stress syndrome or not uh, will depend to some extent on all of the other characteristics, who their baseline are, what kind of uh, help they get now, and whether they have other effects that, uh, that, that happen in their life. So it's a, it's a group of children. I'm glad you're asking about them. Uh, because we've thought a lot about the children who died, but the children who were there uh, are really still very much uh, on the minds of uh, uh, the pediatricians in that area. I know they've uh, come and, and uh, given some help to the families, but John, you may have other thoughts. I think the families and the teachers are going to see the children in several different lights, as Judy was saying, that there are going to be many of these children who are frightened to go back to school. They may be frightened by particular places um, or sounds which remind them of the trauma that they've been through. So that going back into school, they may have school phobia. Uh, once they're in school, they may not be able to concentrate as well. They may cry more often. They may be more difficult um, children for a little while to teach various things. Uh, and as Judy said, it's really important to try and reestablish the education school life as an important part of what they're expected to do. Families at home are going to see slightly different responses. The kids may well be, as Judy said, more likely to wet their bed. They may sleep less well. They may cry more often. They may um, respond to sudden noises or changes 
in ways that they didn't before. And so uh, these will um, need to be addressed both as a community, a family, and a school together um, and over time to see how a different child and a different family um, f uh, manages the, um, the changes that these children face. There's been much discussion of the mental health of the shooter, Adam Lanza, who was known to be withdrawn and isolated throughout adolescence. In another perspective article, Walkup and Rubin have offered a sketch of the differential diagnosis for young people who are withdrawn and have isolative behavior. And that differential includes autism spectrum disorders, anxiety, effects of trauma, the schizophrenia prodrome, and lack of empathy. Do you see many people with this sort of behavior, and does this seem like a reasonable differential? So first of all, uh, the young man who perpetrated this horrible tragedy was very, very, very disturbed. Uh, he was, if we talk about a bell-shaped curve, way off it. Uh, so I want to be very clear about that, that uh, the tra this tragedy uh, occurred because of a very, very disturbed person. But I, but I want to make sure we, we make a clear differentiation between uh, the shooter and the population of young people who have uh, mental health disorders because he really was uh, so terribly disturbed and, and this was... Uh, uh, a tragedy of huge magnitude. Um, I think what the uh, authors of the paper were trying to uh, get us to think about is that isolation uh, is a very serious problem for people, for anybody, but specifically for people with mental health disorders. Uh, we can uh, see them uh, being anxious and depressed and these kinds of things feeding on themselves. So I think the differential uh, that they put forward was extremely helpful uh, because we tend to think about the acting out child or, or the one that's disrupting and causing problems. Uh, and fortunately for that, those kids, they get help <laughs> because they are uh, very visible. It's the young person who's in the corner, who's not speaking up, who's maybe not coming to school. Those are, are people that may be hurting very, very much. And so uh, I think that's what the, uh, the, the point of, uh, of the paper was. I think there are several aspects to the paper. Um, one is that there are certain diagnoses which may be more associated with lack of self-control or impulse control or may be associated with irrational outbursts of some sort. I think what Judy and I are saying is that it's not only those children that we need to worry about. We often need to worry about the children who are perhaps quieter, more angry, less supported. They don't stimulate the response from a teacher or from the family for disciplinary issues. But underneath all of this, they are, as she says, seething or worried. In our practices, we see children all the way from three and four-year-olds up to 20-year-olds who we may worry more about because they are quieter. We've seen them get into trouble because they don't stimulate the attention from their teachers or their parents or for law enforcement um, that the acting out ones do. And acting out in itself may be some therapeutic uh, issue and some therapeutic um, activity for children who have a lot of energy or need to act out. Um, but that generates a response and therefore therapy. The quieter ones may be more troubled um, and we don't know quite how to handle that trouble because they often withdraw and are less responsive to people's work with them. And so we worry that underneath all of that, something that we don't understand might explode. Some of these children also are the ones that are bullied because they are quieter, and they, instead of striking back and showing what they might do, they withdraw further and get more angry, internalize it, and then it might explode at some point. So you suggest that pediatricians can, in fact, identify such children. What about treatment, particularly given the shortage of child psychiatrists in the country? 
Let me go back for a moment to the identification. I think it is hard to identify this particular group of people. Often these diagnoses are not made because people don't think of these children as mentally disturbed uh, until something acts out. As you say, what we're saying uh, to pediatricians, schools, parents is watch all your children for the things that might be worrisome traits and act on them, talk about them, address the child, work with the child, don't let the child withdraw further, don't let the child just be active in the cellar or some dark place around the school, but try to engage them in ways that increase our understanding about what they might be, um, then get mental health through the school system, through the health system, or through the law enforcement system to act to do the best they can. I think what you were indicating is that our mental health uh, resources are not as easily available as we would like them to be. Uh, there are a number of ways that uh, the community can, though, be very supportive to children like this. I think of a story uh, of a theatrical group uh, where the rule for the theatrical group was that anybody in the community should be able to participate. And there was a little boy who probably met these criteria uh, who was in the group and the, uh, the leader of the group said, boy, I don't know how I can, I can work this. But it was the accepted situation that that little boy was going to have a part in the theatrical group. And they worked on finding a way. And that's the kind of thing that I think we need our community to, to pull together to say everybody should be included uh, in, our, in our groups, uh, whether it's a church or whether it's uh, in a community uh, theatrical or it's a sports, uh, so that this isolation is something that we uh, attack directly. But I think that's this, this very brilliant thing that the paper has pointed out about how exclusion from our communities and isolation is a very dangerous thing. Another thing that you discuss in your article that's dangerous is violence on television and video games and how those instances of violence contribute to events like the one in Newtown. Over your years of practice, have, have you noticed children's attitudes toward violence changing? How much of a factor do you think violent entertainment is in all of this? Well, we, we actually have some pretty good evidence that the violence on TV and in the internet games and, and so forth is contributing to aggressive behavior in children. And this has been done by a number of groups. One of the big ones is our media center here at, at Harvard that uh, Mike Rich runs and, and other centers that the AAP have been involved with. There have actually now been over 2,000 studies that make it clear that the violence in the TV shows and the movies and the internet games and so forth uh, do contribute to uh, aggressive behavior. And the correlation for these things is as high as the uh, relationship between um, low calcium and bone density or between lead uh, toxicity and IQ or between HIV prevention with condoms. So this is a, a huge association between the violence in our media and aggressive behavior in children. There, there's no question about it. What we're seeing uh, is kind of interesting, and that is, uh, at least in my experience, the, the youngsters coming in with their eyes glued to the little uh, game that they're playing, uh, not paying a lot of attention to the uh, area around them and so forth. Uh, but I think we're seeing a lot of other things uh, as well. There's certainly been a shift over the past 15, 20 years from outdoor activities to indoor screen time. And a number of people have tried to decrease the screen time based on the kinds of studies that Judy's talking about. We also have seen that the kind of play that might happen indoors uh, may be more aggressive so that more children are doing professional wrestling or more children are copying um, the way that people fight on video games or shoot in TVs and movies. Uh, in the old days, uh, kids would go outside and they'd be sent out to play 
football, soccer, baseball, um, basketball, um, and they'd get off uh, a lot of their energy there. They'd let off their steam outdoors in physical activity. But what we're seeing now is much more of an attention to what's being shown on TV, what's being shown on movies, what's being uh, seen indoors, and a child who doesn't have the outlets to um, use physical means to get rid of steam, let off steam, um, gets panned up, um, and they tend to shoot harder, more violently, more focused uh, ways than they used to. One of the other things that people are concerned about is that the, there's an association between the shooting and uh, sort of a pleasurable outcome. There's not an, an understanding that when someone dies, it's a very sad thing. And the worry about empathy and about consequences and about the association of uh, this being a pleasurable thing to shoot is what many people think is the uh, uh, area that we need to really address so that uh, there is violence in the world, uh, and young people need to know that and need to understand it, but they need to know that there are consequences of it. And I'm talking particularly about the, some of the older children uh, or even the, the shooter. Uh, this lack of empathy, of understanding the consequence that this really, you really did shoot somebody, you really did kill them, it really has a long-term consequence. That seems to be what the kids have always played, and they've always played good guys and bad guys, but this lack of, of real understanding of, of that uh, seems to be the, the central core. There seems to be a glorification of violence as a means of conflict resolution, and so that's what they see over and over again. We have to counterbalance the ways that children are taught to or allowed to resolve some conflict or get something that they want. Um, and so that they are allowed to fight or take away, um, or they've seen it um, shown on movies or TV or in these video games, that they can shoot their way to what they want, as opposed to talk their way, negotiate their way, and gain self-confidence and strength in other ways than just through their guns or arms. Moving from virtual guns to real guns, you note in your article that the guidelines of the American Academy of Pediatrics now recommend that families be screened for gun ownership and gun owners be counseled about safety measures such as removing the guns from their homes. Are pediatricians taking these steps, and, and if so, with what results? Well, I'm very proud to say pediatricians are doing that. We've had some nice studies that, that really show not only that they're doing it, but that the uh, we've had a large randomized controlled study that we talked about in the article, that the counseling that they're giving is being taken up by the patients. So we're very proud of that. Uh, we really started this work uh, during the late 1980s, 1990s, when there was the huge uh, epidemic of gun violence. Uh, we didn't want to stay silent at that time. And so the Academy made these recommendations, and the members have absolutely taken them up. Um, what you may want to understand is that this is in the context of all the safety precautions that we talk about. So just as you do a physical exam from head to toe, during the preventive uh, portion of the examination, we ask about everything. So it's not singling out, and it's not singling out a, a behavior, nor is it singling out a kind of person. We ask everybody the same things. Do you have seat belts? Do you have uh, bicycle helmets? Do you have, uh, by any chance, a gun in the home? And we go through it as a routine list. It's not, oh, I just saw you come in. I know you're the one that's going to have you know, this particular problem. We also ask about depression, and we ask about alcohol, and we ask about even uh, domestic violence if, if uh, there's been any worries about those things. So the families are, are used to, to going through that litany, and they know we're not sort of picking out you versus you. It's, it's part of the routine. These came from guidelines that Judy helped write more than a decade ago, which pediatricians everywhere use for screening, as she says, about the environment, which may be lead poisoning or poisons under the uh, counter, 
um, to family violence, to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, and so people are actually comfortable that we are asking these questions on their behalf and for the safety and the well-being of the family, of the community. Um, and I do this all the time. I work with a population that unfortunately suffers a great deal of gun uh, violence and, and other forms of violence. And the families almost universally look at these questions as beneficial. Thank you for asking that. Um, now, we do turn up people who have guns. We ask why. They give us answers. And then we try to give them practical solutions to keeping their home safe if they really feel they need it. Um, and as we mentioned in the article, people are discovered in this way who have put a gun in the glove compartment or a gun in the upper drawer. And they never thought of this as being something dangerous for their toddler. But when they realize that that could be more dangerous than it is beneficial, it allows us an opportunity to talk about ways to keep the family and that community safer overall, not just in terms of this gun violence, but how do we make an environment safe so that children can grow up and be healthy. And, and particularly for young people who do have identified mental health problems, particularly depression, it's very important for their families to know uh, how critical a step it can be. The depressed youngster finds a gun, has the means quickly to do something that they may do impulsively, and talking with a family about the increased risk that there may be in that situation, the families are, are very grateful to have that information and to think about it. At the national level, President Obama has just proposed a number of steps to reduce gun violence, including background checks for all gun purchases, reinstating the ban on assault weapons, reinstating the limit of 10 rounds in ammunition magazines, and back to what we talked about a few minutes ago, beefing up mental health services and coverage. Do you think that these steps will actually be instituted, and if so, would they be efficient? Well, we have a wonderful country. And I think that our country will embrace these steps. I think no one in this country uh, wants to have the kind of tragedies that we've been dealing with. Uh, how that will happen and which group and legislature versus executive and so forth, I'm not sure. But this is the right direction and uh, the speed with which the president and vice president have done this, I think, shows their seriousness uh, about these things. I'm, I'm hopeful that the, the uh, Congress and others will follow suit. But even more importantly is for uh, individuals, uh, the people at the community level, our gun owners, our churches, our schools, all of us to really take to heart what this, this has meant uh, for our, our communities. And I think having these specific actions that can be taken is uh, really a step in, in the right direction. And we you know, have the permeability between the state lines so that you know, uh, Connecticut had some not so bad laws, but in fact, uh, this youngster was able to get an assault rifle in a state that didn't have the ban. So ha having the laws strengthened, having the uh, gun checks uh, so that people who've had difficulties are, are thought about uh, is a really uh, phenomenal step in the right direction. I think this is excellent, but I think we all have to remember that it's only a partial solution. Um, and what we're trying to do as pediatricians and urge parents to do, and as Judy said, other members of the community like teachers and ministers and law enforcement, is to get everybody to think about this as a broader problem which needs conversation. Um, what we want to do is to encourage everybody to be talking about how we make our country safer and that every citizen actually has a responsibility. They may have the right, do have the right to own guns, but they have a responsibility to keep their communities and their children and their families safe. How do you do that? Um, and in, instead of trying to polarize the country by setting gun owners opposed to gun control advocates, what we are trying to do is to bring everybody together and make it clear that it's the responsibility of gun owners and gun control advocates to 
engage in a dialogue that says, all right, we know we have violence here. We know there's an opportunity for people who should not have access to guns, such as toddlers, children, people with mental health problems, to get access to them. How do we problem solve that? And so what our responsibility, I think, as citizens, in addition to what the president has done and what the Congress has to do, is to engage in this conversation, not in a bellicose way, but with the attitude that we've got to solve this problem. And there's a responsibility on all sides to make a world that does have guns in it, where everybody has a right to have guns, make this world safe for our children and the citizens of the community, come up with our own community guidelines that say this is what the best practice is, and pediatricians are enamored with best practices as should everybody be in business and everything else. What we want to do is to have everybody come up with best practices to make a world that has guns in it absolutely safe, period, end of it. In addition to taking up those responsibilities of citizens, are there particular measures that physicians should be taking? Yes. There are specific actions that we believe pediatricians should be taking, the doctors, nurses, uh, medical people should be taking, screening and identifying whether there is a gun risk for our patients is, we think, very much uh, something that should be done. And this is why we were so concerned when uh, the law was passed uh, in Florida, which countermanded our ability to do that. And that's why the Florida American Academy of Pediatrics brought suit against the state of Florida for that. So right within our professional mandate, we do believe addressing the the gun risks is, is extremely important. But second to that, and as we're doing now, we believe very strongly uh, that pediatricians, nurses, doctors should be working at a community level, at a society level, to think about what are the things that we can do to make the world as rich and uh, as supportive for our children as we possibly can. The fact that children are not having the kind of community experiences that they don't often have uh, after school, that they are not getting the kind of uh, career advice, the the sense of their own self-worth and their ne- the fact that they are needed in our society, all of these things are really contributing to the dependence on the games and uh, pulling themselves away from each other. Uh, So in addition to the work that we do clinically one-on-one, we feel very strongly in pediatrics that we should be working at a community level uh, to be sure that there are parks, to be sure that there are after-school programs. And even at a more advanced level, to be thinking about what makes our children effective. Uh, one thing we've been thinking a lot about, why, why would you like to shoot things? Well, when you shoot things, it's kind of effective. Something happens. Uh, so how can we be sure that our children are engaged in our world in a very effective way? Uh, how about if instead of shooting things, they were helping to plant things? How about if they were working on our environment? How about if they were working uh, on our uh, sports fields and so forth? So so turning the conversation, turning the dialogue away from a antisocial to a pro-social dialogue. Parents, pediatricians, teachers, and others around children are in unique roles uh, in terms of enabling children to grow up. Uh, And so when we ask pediatricians, and set guidelines for the way visits should go, we're asking them to look at many elements of life. And parents listen to us. They listen to teachers. They listen to ministers. What we're asking pediatricians and other physicians to do is to think about all of the elements that enable good, healthy growth and self-growth intellectually and cognitively as well as physical growth. And so, as Judy's saying, safe environments are important, outdoor activities are important, but there are certain parenting issues and community issues which are also important. We need to empower parents to say no. 
uh, to children to enable them to gain self-control and impulse control. And when they don't see this happening either in school or at home, to work together with the teachers and the mental health people and the physicians and whoever else happens to be around, and this may be different from one family to another, to help every child, whether they are withdrawn or hyperactive, to become good, functional, safe members of that community. So being involved in looking at the whole child and what will make that child's life be safe, but also successful, learn responsibility, learn self-control and confidence um, are all important, but it, it incorporates a whole environment, not just a cold or an upset stomach or diabetes. It involves involving yourself and the families and the community to help children grow up well and safely. The other thing that we feel very strongly about in pediatrics is that we do have many children with mental health concerns. It, they probably are increasing in our community, and we don't have enough resources for those children and families. And so again, one of our roles is to speak up and to say, uh, this is a very serious problem. We've, we've gotten parity on paper, but we don't have it in reality. And so uh, one of the things that I believe happened today was Mr. Obama committing to a true parity for mental health disorders. And uh, I think people have not understood how serious and how big a problem mental health is among our young people. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Sean.